in three, two, one. <laughs> Hello, Facebook world, and welcome to another Mind Jam podcast. And boy, today I am hugely honored that we have the legendary Dr. Ian Dunbar with us today, Dr. Karen Becker. Dr. Dunbar, the training world is a complete different creature to myself. Uh, like I say, we delve in like health and nutrition. There is such emerging science showing how important training and longevity and health and the overall mental well-being. I wanted to ask you, you've been doing this for quite some time. So you've seen a few decades of the shift in behavior training. I mean, I, you know, I, I bought this I'm a huge junkie of all these old magazines now. This, oh, good Lord. James yeah. Spratt. These, like, I have a couple of these from the 1800s. Like, I collect these because I want, I want to know, you know, before the internet, how information was and how nutrition was perceived back in the day. And believe it or not, these manuals also have a section on training. And it's so fascinating to see back then, like in the later part of the 1800s, you know, there's a, a little section in here that says if your dog jumps, just hold him by his two front paws and step on his back feet to teach him a lesson to not jump on you anymore, which is very effective. How have or you seen him in the chest or flip him over backwards or, you know, grab him by the cheeks and rah, rah, give him an out, you know, yeah, rubbish, silliness. How have you seen that, Dr. Dunbar? How have you seen this transformation from when you started until like right now, like looking through your lens? How have you seen this shift in training? Because from my world, I know that it's kind of divided and there's, you know, there's these different names. Like you have one name like called like positive training, the other one called dominance or alpha training. Like it seems like there's these two different worlds that are out there and well, they don't love each other. Um, no, it's a, you know, a lot of training is, it's very close to a religion. It's a belief. And so it, you get a lot of emotion. Uh, people disagree and they get angry when they disagree rather than um, talking about facts. And to me, if you're a trainer, then you're changing behavior. And this, of course, is observable and can be quantified. So I tell people, look, first, train the dog. And then uh, let's have proof of training. We test the dog. Then we calculate the speed of training. And then we can discuss how you got there. But what we have at the moment are arguments between people who are using, say, they're still jerking with metal leashes and they're shocking. Uh, we have people who only use food and kindness, yet neither of them are training the dog. If you, you look at these trainers, they either still wearing a bait bag or they've still got a shock collar button in their hand. So my definition of training is that your dog's under verbal control at a distance when distracted without the continued need of any training aid whatsoever. Well, they haven't got there. So I tell them then you can't discuss training. Until you've trained a dog, then we can have a meaningful discussion. And of course, everyone would say, well, let's get there in the quickest way that's as pleasurable as possible for the dog and the owners. Uh, in the 80s and the 90s, I traveled everywhere lecturing about this stuff and doing workshops so people could see it, that you trained 12 puppies off leash, you know, and they learned and, and, and people couldn't believe it. And one by one, they would come to me and, and they were really upset because they knew what they had done was wrong, jerking the dog, hitting him, spraying him with vinegar and lemon juice, kicking him, kneeing him. And they just knew this whole sort of inhibitory technique taking the dog out of the dog was wrong, but they didn't know an alternative. And now they did, they felt terrible. And so I'd say, look, you know, the past was then, this is now. And then the people using rewards just became, how should I put it, belligerent, and they wouldn't tolerate anyone else. Like, oh, you're, you're jerking, you're a horrible person. It wasn't the, let me show you a better way. And I tried to explain to them, I said, look, you used to do that too. Remember when I met you and we talked in the bar after the conference and I converted you from a leash jerker, you know, who all they did was punish dogs for misbehaving and ignoring all the good stuff into a puppy trainer that focused on all the good that dogs do and rewarding it. But they had no tolerance for, for other trainers and it became a very ugly, toxic place and this even invaded 
the boards of the dog training associations. There's a whole lot of discord in the training community. And every time there's a difference of opinion, it's a little bit like religion, where every time there's a difference of opinion, people just started a new religion until you have so many different religions, you can find something that fits your viewpoint so that you can have relief. And that's kind of happened in the last 50 years with training. There's national training institutions. There's a dozen different organizations that have a dozen different viewpoints and theories and value systems and beliefs, and you can find something to line up with, with what you believe in. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get results. You've done a really fantastic job of engaging conversations with all of these groups, knowing as a scientist, a researcher, PhD, that they may not get results, but you still continue the discussion. And I admire that. Well, you see, my religion is results. It's be, I, I, I was trained as a behaviorist, uh, someone who observes and quantifies behavior. And then I became interested in operant how you change the behavior. What are they doing? How much are they doing it? Can we change that so it's acceptable? So like clicker training would never become popular if they hadn't got a clicker. And now that has become a religion. And people just think clicker train without thinking a very slow way to train. Why don't we just lure reward? Now I'm finished teaching 10 behaviors. You're still working on one, you know? So it's a great training technique for teaching behaviors outside of the dog's normal behavior repertoire or fine-tuning behaviors, but it's not a way for pet owners to train a pet dog, so it's much too complicated and requires a, too much of a, a, a skill set. Gradually, dog trainers got scared of training dogs off-leash, and if you look at even puppy classes now, you will find, if you find one where the puppies are off-leash, it's only for 20, 30 percent of the time. The rest of the time they're on leash, the owner's sitting on a chair listening to the trainer lecture. Whereas our puppy classes are off leash for 55 minutes because that's how you live with the dog at home. Because they don't have them off leash, the puppies don't get socialized. And as soon as we get this dog dog reactivity, I, I would say people and trainers are very concerned, very frustrated, but scared to let the dogs just do what is absolutely normal. So to me, the religion is results. And so I always argue that. I, I don't even touch on the inhumanity of some aspects of dog training. So I, I have to ask you pertaining to longevity. One of the key things today, and they find this in the human field, Dr. Dunbar, is if you were to put like genetics and nutrition and all those things on the side, a very rich social life is critical for longevity. The Sardinians and all the way over in Italy that have the most sanitarians, 100-year-old live people. I, I think all the blue zones. All the blue zones. All zone. the blue zones. A rich social life is critical. What do, you, what do you know today about longevity and training? Well, in, in the groups you, you're mentioning, there's two things. That a rich social life, which every dog should have. Every dog should have a core social group of, of dogs they don't have to get along with every dog at the dog park, but they should have five dogs that they've known since puppy and they meet at least once or twice a week. And they need a core social group of humans. You know, we, you know it's, it's unrealistic to expect dogs to get along with every dog. Humans can't even get along with every human, for heaven's sake, right? Especially if they're a dog trainer, you know. So let's be realistic. So that's a give. So back to longevity in dogs, this is my big bugabear. And I'll, I'll try and do this briefly without crying because it upsets me so much. When a prospective puppy buyer buys a puppy, the notion is I'm getting it from a breeder. All breeders are good. No, by definition, half of breeders will fall below median, right? As will any professional. Half of veterinarians are below medium. You watch them at vet college you know, hamming up so-called operations. Half are above median. Some are excellent every profession, but they believe that any breeder is excellent. And then the breeder talks down to them, you know, holier than now, high horse type of stuff. And then they end up buying an eight week old puppy that is not house trained. I mean, this stuff gets really scary. It's not house trained at eight weeks. What was that breeder doing? It's not chew toy trained. Why is that important? 
because that prevents destructive chewing, excessive barking, and separation anxiety. It doesn't even know how to sit, let alone lie down, come, roll over, heal, and walk on a leash. It's only been socialized to three people, all women at the kennel, all middle-aged women at the kennel. It should have met 100 people prior to eight weeks of age, mostly children and men. Critical period of socialization ends at eight weeks. But here's the killer. Not only will that dog definitely start to become fearful when it's five to eight months old. You see, it appears totally friendly as a puppy. It's a puppy, but normal development is fears and phobias don't develop until later in life. So the insufficient socialization starts to show five to eight weeks, slow to approach, head ducking, doesn't want to be handled, eventually biting the veterinarian when they try to clean its ears or clip its toenails. But don't worry about it because the dog's going to die when it's five. My first Malamute purebred died at five. Two other purebreds dead at seven. The latest Zuzu Aboseron broke my heart. Dead at seven. This is ridiculous. Why is this? Because there's no selective pressure at all to breed for longevity because it's not needed in the dog world. When dogs are bred for show, their career is over by four or five years. If it's bred as a working dog, it's over by four, five, or six, or seven years. Bred as an obedience dog, it's usually not working anymore by two, or its career is over by four. The dog fancy doesn't want dogs to live a long time, because then you have to feed them while they're 13, 15, 17. And I met someone the other day with a 20-year-old dog. Dr. Dunbar, we were discussing, of course, before the show, as you had mentioned, we have breeders that are below average, and then we have those breeders that are above average, those excellent breeders that we all know. I myself have a teammate named Lisa on the Planet Paws team who's doing some unbelievable things, her and a whole bunch of Frenchie breeders, putting the nose back on the breed so it's you know, able to breathe. I know Dr. Karen Becker talked about reparative confirmation, those breeders that are doing genetic testing and doing things that are over and above to fix some of the damages that have been done over the last 100 years. And of course, those people in dog shows, there's the select few out there that you read those scary stories of the things that they are doing online around the world. But there are those incredible people in dog shows that actually care about longevity, that really want their dogs to live a very long time and care about the health span and lifespan of their pet. But let me ask you, what do you think that pet parents need to be aware of? You know, if they do go see a breeder, what do they need to think about? I think, and this is the big part of my program, when owners know how to select a dog that will likely enjoy some sunset is, and if you're a newfie, at least make it till you're 14 and not be dead at seven, not dying of cancer when you're seven as a golden or a boxer. How do we do this? So I develop what I call a longevity index. This is the average age of a puppy's great-great-grandparents at death. So we, we were both invited to do TED Talks in Mexico City. And we, we wanted to talk about longevity because there's data, the Morris Foundation with the $25 million golden retriever project that's currently underway. When you talk to the veterinarians of the 70s, Dr. Michael Lappin, who's part of the Morris Foundation $25 million project, he practiced in the 70s. He said the average veterinarian saw golden retrievers walk in through that door that lived to be 17 years old. And today oh, yeah. you're yeah. lucky if they live to be eight or nine. So you've witnessed that, you've seen that. Tell me, yeah. is that true? Like, because my generation don't know that. We only know nine-year-old dogs. Have we seen a decline in lifespan because of this breeding and all of these issues you're talking about from the 70s to today? Absolutely, absolutely. I remember one of the most dramatic moments of my very short veterinary career was um, explaining to a man um, who was 70 and his dad, that we had to euthanize their dog because every system is failing. Uh, the dog was 19, but no dogs lived to an, it was amazing. Whenever you selectively breed for anything, whether it's work um, or confirmation, everything else goes by the by. And so my simple solution to that is, okay, selectively for breed for what you want, but don't breed any male dog unless he's 10. 
I proposed this to the International Congress of Kennel Clubs in the early 80s. You've got to socialize puppies and don't breed the male dogs when they're two. In an afternoon, they can sire 100 puppies. Heaven forbid they win Crufts or Westminster or Credit Valley. But heaven forbid a male dog wins a show, he could destroy a breed in one weekend. You know, a, a male dog can mate four or five times a day when he's two years old. Well, and, and not you know? to mention, well, and not to mention that we're shipping that semen. If a do if a male two year old dog wins a Westminster, we ship that semen all over the world. I mean, that's exactly why the golden retriever crashed, right? We shipped semen from winnering dogs that were six years of age and died of lymphoma. And but interestingly, Dr. Dunbar, recent research has just come about that telomeres continue to develop in male dogs much past adulthood that we thought. It stemmed down from the human, the human research showed that older men that had babies, they passed on that longevity gene. The telomeres, so the, the little, for people that don't know, the little tiny end caps on your DNA, what science says is the longer the telomere in science, the longer that you're going to live. And that when you were young, so it, for instance, in the dog world, the two-year-old puppy or the two-year-old dog, adult dog, whatever you want to consider them, well, these got short telomeres. And by three, they're longer. By four, they get even longer. By five, they get even longer. And the longer that the telomere becomes, the longer the dog lives. Then that dog breeds and passes down those long telomeres onto his offspring. So you saying that you believe that, you know, that these dogs it should start breeding around 10 years old is mind blowing to me because it's, it's prefacing what science is saying today. It's validating what science is saying today, that the longer that you wait, you will be passing on longer telomeres onto your offspring, whether human or it, it, whether dog. It, it validates what nature says too. And the, the single biggest criticism to this from breeders is, but, oh, but you'll have a low sperm count then, then collect the sperm whenever you like at seven years. What is the optimal age to collect for sperm seven years and then save it till he's 10? Because if we need proof positive, he made it to 10. Owners will now know the questions to ask the breeders. I want to see the longevity index. I want to know I'm getting a companion dog that will likely live for a long time. Dr. Dunbar, you, you've done something pretty magical you know, you mentioned earlier that, of course, training is like religion. And, you know, we say it ourselves in our space, religion, politics and nutrition, there's nothing more visceral. And I'm sure training will equally be added into one of those categories. And it's very easy to see people with different techniques. And when you integrate money and business in with those techniques and having to put food on the table and now building a social media following, the pressures of the day to day can really disrupt communication. But you did something mm -hmm. that was when I was doing my research on you, like literally my jaw was on the ground because in the beginning, the media, I was reading an article by SF gate that called you initially at that time, the anti Caesar Milan, but rather than attacking somebody else on a popular platform with a complete different technique than you, you did something that I believe that more people in this world need to do, which was you built a bridge between you and somebody else who had a complete different mindset or was on a different planet than you were. There was an olive branch that you put out where Caesar Milan himself brought you into his book and allowed you to say things word for word. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I hope to inspire younger and future generations by what you did, because now with up and coming social media stars in the training world, you're seeing the divide of today, which was the divide of yesterday. And yet here's a veterinarian, a PhD, who builds a bridge. Everything I do with puppies is about people training. All that I've learned from teaching puppies, dogs, a different species, um, has taught me about people, whether it's raising a child or motivating an employee or, or, or what. And, and I tell people, I tell dog trainers, you know, if you insult, belittle or demean an owner, then you've lost the opportunity to train the, train the dog. If you insult or demean or say you hate another dog trainer, you've lost the opportunity to educate thousands of dogs. 
And so when Cesar Milan came to me, his producer said, we're going to change the, the, the nature of the program. And instead, Caesar will be the host interviewing other trainers. Would I be willing to do it? And I thought long and hard because then people in, in the dog training world in, were, were, they hated him. They thought he was a devil. And I thought, well, you know, will I trash my street cred and will I be hated if I do this? And then I, I talked with my, uh, the other two members of my triumvirate, my ex-wife and my son, and said, should I do this? And we all agreed, yes. Okay. On the morning it happened, they then said, no, we can't do this. We will be crucified. I said, no. I said, we're going to do it. And I don't work with contracts. I work with a handshake. I will do it. But the next thing was, I knew Cesar was going to interview me, and I knew who was going to ask the question about our difference of opinion. And I thought, well, he's in my house, and I'm English. You're not rude to house guests, you know? And But I so strongly disagree with so much that he does, so what do I say? And then it came to me. I was falling asleep one night, having a little scotch, and it came to me what I was going to say. And, and he asked me, well, Dr. Dumba, you know, methods are very different, so, you know, how do you reconcile that? I'll say, well, in a, a nutshell, Cesar, um, my grandfather, because he, he always talks about his grandpa, right? I said, my grandpa always impressed on me that to touch an animal is an earned privilege. It's not a right. And I guess I feel you're much too quick to put your hands on a dog. And in a lot of instances, I feel you frighten the dog. So I thought I was totally honest, but I said it in a nice way. And I think that quote is in the book, too, pretty There's much. There's going to be many people, and there are many people, and up-and-coming trainers today, that I've seen sort of this transformation because of that, that marry of the two philosophies, those moments that you had, like one of those moments with Caesar Milan. There's these new age trainers that are coming out now that are either calling themselves um, integrative trainers, meaning they're using philosophies from both sides of the world. You have the, the term balanced trainer. It's almost like if on that day where you were willing to sit with somebody who had a complete different belief system, you married a new training technique. So my question, what happened after that day to you? Because there's going to be people that hear this podcast that you're going to inspire to reach out to that other trainer that they don't maybe agree with, but they say, you know what, if Dr. Dunbar did it, then I should be able to do it. What happened after that? Was there, like, did you lose friends? Did you have people say to you, I don't ever want to talk to you again? Did you have people say that was the greatest thing you ever did and I want to do it? When it comes to disagreements about dog training, I, I'm there right away on our website, um, even our public page. I, I do it once a week. I go through and respond to every comment and smooth the waters and I explain why I did this or said this, like um, a, an immediate reaction is, why are you always talking about puppies? Don't you know there's thousands of dogs that die in shelters? I come back and say, I always talk about puppies because every shelter dog was once a puppy where we, as dog professionals, failed. Whatever reason. You know, and so I come over and explain it, and I found that people really like this. The angrier they are, the more they like it. And so I think now the secret to changing things um, is what you're doing. A podcast that gets a few hundred thousand views. That's incredible because we have to reach dog owners. What an incredible conversation. Um, you are a bridge builder, my friend, and an inspiration to a lot of up and coming young future trainers or people within the, the health industry, veterinarians, whoever the case may be. Um, I want to I want to salute you for all the work you've done over the years and what you're still continuously doing. Well, I have to say, the two of you are wonderful. I mean, I've obviously been interviewed a lot. You had very sort of deep, perceptive, insightful questions, and it for me, it just it's I love doing this, but I especially love doing it with you two guys. So call on me any time. You're doing a fantastic job of not only building bridges, but helping this next generation of pet parents 
build a relationship with their dog that is lifelong and fulfilling and meaningful meaningful for both of them. And I just appreciate your, your commitment to doing that as a professional, but also that's just who you are as a dog lover. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Of course you had to trump my, of course you had to trump my, my how awesome he is with your how awesome he is. Okay. Uh.